Welcome to our worship from Seal Church, led by me, Canon Anne Labar. The hymn which ends the service is sung by the choristers of St Martin in the Fields. During the season of Christmas and Epiphany, we remember that Jesus is called Emmanuel, which means God is with us, and so we pray. Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hidden. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Christ our Lord. Amen. The Bible says the grace of God has dawned upon the world through our Saviour Jesus Christ. And so in confidence and trust, we confess our sins. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, we have sinned against you and against our neighbour in thought and word and deed, through negligence, through weakness, through our own deliberate fault. We are truly sorry and repent of all our sins. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, who died for us, forgive us all that is past and grant that we may serve you in newness of life to the glory of your name. Amen. Almighty God, who forgives all who truly repent, have mercy upon you, pardon and deliver you from all your sins, confirm and strengthen you in all goodness, and keep you in life eternal, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Almighty God, in Christ you make all things new. Transform the poverty of our nature by the riches of your grace, and in the renewal of our lives make known your heavenly glory. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who is alive and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. The first reading is from the Old Testament book of 1 Samuel, Chapter 3, beginning at verse 1. The boy Samuel was ministering to the Lord under Eli. The word of the Lord was rare in those days. Visions were not widespread. At that time, Eli, whose eyesight had begun to grow dim so that he could not see, was lying down in his room. The lamp of God had not yet gone out, and Samuel was lying down in the temple of the Lord, where the ark of God was. Then the Lord called, Samuel, Samuel. And he said, Here I am, and ran to Eli, and said, Here I am, you called me. But Eli said, I did not call, lie down again. So he went and lay down. The Lord called again, Samuel. Samuel got up and went to Eli and said, Here I am, for you called me. But he said, I did not call my son. Lie down again. Now Samuel did not yet know the Lord, and the word of the Lord had not yet been revealed to him. The Lord called Samuel again a third time, and he got up and went to Eli and said, Here I am, for you called me. Then Eli perceived that the Lord was calling the boy. Therefore Eli said to Samuel, Go, lie down, and if he calls you, you shall say, Speak, Lord, for your servant is listening. So Samuel went and lay down in his place. Now the Lord came and stood there, calling as before, Samuel, Samuel. And Samuel said, Speak, for your servant is listening. Then the Lord said to Samuel, See, I am about to do something in Israel that will make both ears of anyone who hears of it tingle. On that day I will fulfil against Eli all that I have spoken concerning his house from beginning to end. For I have told him that I am about to punish his house forever, for the iniquity that he knew, because his sons were blaspheming God, and he did not restrain them. Therefore I swear to the house of Eli that the iniquity of Eli's house shall not be expiated by sacrifice or offering forever. Samuel lay there until morning. Then he opened the doors of the house of the Lord. 
Samuel was afraid to tell the vision to Eli. But Eli called Samuel and said, Samuel, my son. He said, Here I am. Eli said, What was it that he told you? Do not hide it from me. May God do so to you and more also if you hide anything from me of all that he told you. So Samuel told him everything and hid nothing from him. Then he said, It is the Lord. Let him do what seems good to him. As Samuel grew up, the Lord was with him and let none of his words fall to the ground. And all Israel from Dan to Beersheba knew that Samuel was a trustworthy prophet of the Lord. The Gospel is from John's Gospel, chapter 1, beginning at verse 43. The next day Jesus decided to go to Galilee. He found Philip and said to him, Follow me. Now Philip was from Bethsaida, the city of Andrew and Peter. Philip found Nathanael and said to him, We have found him about whom Moses in the law and also the prophets wrote, Jesus, son of Joseph, from Nazareth. Nathanael said to him, Can anything good come out of Nazareth? Philip said to him, Come and see. When Jesus saw Nathanael coming toward him, he said of him, Here is truly an Israelite in whom there is no deceit. Nathanael asked him, Where did you come to know me? Jesus answered, I saw you under the fig tree before Philip called you. Nathanael replied, Rabbi, you are the Son of God, you are the King of Israel. Jesus answered, Do you believe because I told you that I saw you under the fig tree? You will see greater things than these. And he said to him, Very truly I tell you, you will see heaven opened, and the angels of God ascending and descending upon the Son of Man. In the name of God, Father, Son and Holy Spirit. Amen. In today's Bible readings, we heard two stories about people who took a bit of getting through to. People who just didn't seem to be able to hear or see something which they needed to. Nathaniel can't believe that Jesus might be the Messiah at first. Samuel takes all night to realise that God is speaking to him. And the old priest, Eli, has been unable or unwilling to hear the voice of God for many years. I expect we can all sympathise with them. I'm sure we've all been confronted with a truth about something or someone which, looking back, we feel we should have known all along. Worse still... Perhaps we realised that we did know it, but couldn't acknowledge it. Why didn't government see Covid coming and make better preparation for it? Why couldn't the post office have seen that the financial losses that they'd spotted were a glitch in their computer systems, not a sudden outbreak of widespread criminality among their sub-postmasters and mistresses? On a personal level, we might find ourselves asking why we didn't take notice of the niggling symptoms that later turned out to be serious illness, or why we didn't spot the warning signs in a relationship that was getting into difficulties, or why it took us so long to realise that we were called into or out of a particular role or career. In hindsight, it usually all seems so obvious, but so often our vision is clouded and our ears are stopped. In Nathaniel's case, it seems to be prejudice which gets in the way of him seeing the truth about Jesus. A Messiah from Nazareth? You've got to be joking, he says to his friends. We're not sure why Nazareth seemed such a dodgy place to hail from, but presumably people at the time would have understood it. It might have been because the northern territory of Galilee was more mixed ethnically and religiously than the southern lands of Judea around Jerusalem. It was also where the majority of the occupying Roman soldiers were stationed, forcing the people into greater collaboration with them. Or perhaps Nazareth just had a bad reputation, a backwater, Hicksville sort of place that people wanted to avoid. 
Whatever it was, though, Nathaniel is convinced that Nazarenes are not Messiah material, and he can't get past that. It's only when he meets Jesus that he realises his mistake. This man knows him, somehow even better than Nathaniel knows himself. Because Jesus sees Nathaniel's potential as a disciple, something which was way off Nathaniel's radar. Seeing a new truth about Jesus enables him to see a new truth about himself too. The Old Testament story of Eli and Samuel is a more complex tale and a sadder one in many ways. Eli was the old priest at the shrine of Shiloh, where the Ark of the Covenant, the symbol of God's presence in Israel, was kept. He had two adult sons who should have followed him as priests in this important position, but they'd gone off the rails and were abusing their positions. They were stealing the offerings that people were bringing to Shiloh. Eli knew this at some level, but he'd never quite found the courage or the energy to confront them. In the end, of course, they were responsible for themselves, but at least Eli could have tried to influence them, and it seems that he hasn't. And that's where Samuel comes in. A young boy whose mother, Hannah, had brought him to the sanctuary for Eli to bring up as his own. That might seem like a very odd thing for a loving mother to do, but there is, of course, a backstory. Hannah was one of the two wives of her husband, Elkanah. The other wife had borne him lots of children, but Hannah hadn't been able to conceive, and her co-wife and stepchildren never let her forget it. They made her life a misery. In desperation, Hannah came to the shrine at Shiloh and prayed for a child, and her prayers were so passionate that Eli thought she must be drunk. When she explained the situation, though, he assured her that God had heard her prayer and that she would have a son. And it all happened as he said it would. Once the child was weaned, Hannah decided that in thanksgiving she would entrust him to Eli to help at the shrine. As I said, it seems like an odd decision to us, but maybe he'll be safer there than at home with stepbrothers and stepsisters who've treated his mother so badly and will probably do the same to him. But whatever Hannah's motivation, it's clear that she's realised that her child matters not just to her, but to the people of Israel, and that God is calling him to do something important. But as the story says, the word of God was rare in those days. Visions were not widespread. So when God literally calls to him one night as he lies asleep in the sanctuary at Shiloh, it takes quite a while for both Samuel and Eli to work out what's going on. And when Samuel finally does say, Speak, Lord, for your servant is listening, the message he's asked to give Eli is a grim one. It's the end of the road for Eli's household. His sons will eventually be killed in battle, and Eli himself will die of sorrow. No wonder Samuel seems reluctant to pass this message on. But Eli finds the courage to urge Samuel to tell the truth, no matter what it is. And I think by doing that, he teaches Samuel a vital lesson that he'll need to draw on often in the future. The lesson that the truth, however painful, can't be avoided forever. Samuel goes on to be one of Israel's most important prophets. He's instrumental in the lives of King Saul and King David but he's often called by God to challenge them. And those who challenge kings need all the courage they could muster. I like to hope that Eli would have been glad for all his own failures to know that he'd been able to play at least a little part in God's work by his influence over Samuel. And that's what it's all about, God's work. Because it's most often where the pain and the mess are that God is. We see this in Jesus, born in a dung-strewn stable, growing up in that dodgy town of Nazareth, dying on a cross alone and reviled, looking to all the world as if he'd failed. Who would have thought 
that God could be in these squalid places, in these squalid things. Not the Magi who headed first for Herod's palace, not Nathaniel with his blinkered views, not the horrified disciples who ran away from the crucifixion. But that is where God was, at work in the world through Christ. And that's where he still is, in the places, the people, the situations we'd rather not see at all, the things within ourselves we'd rather bury or ignore. It's there that God waits patiently with his healing and his love, because it's there that we need him most. If we turn away from that place, we turn away from God too. I wonder what would happen today if we were to say, as Samuel does, Speak, Lord, for your servant is listening. The truth is, I don't know. That's why it frightens me, as perhaps it does you. But if we are serious in our search for God's presence in our lives and in our world, then maybe it's the places where we least want to be that that may turn out to be the places we'll find him. Amen. And so we bring our prayers to God and we pray together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. Christ, who by his incarnation gathered into one things earthly and heavenly, fill you with peace and goodwill, and make you partakers of the divine nature, And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit be among you and remain with you always. Amen. Amen.